Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk extensively about the vertebral ligaments, which are going to be ligaments that connect various pieces of the spine together and overall produce a stabilizing effect on the spine. One thing that you don't want is you wouldn't want your spine consistently flapping around and being all loose and all that and looking like the wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube man from Family Guy. You don't want that. You want your spine to be as stable as possible because that's going to help, first of all, carry all the weight that you normally have to carry around through walking and standing. But especially if you go to the gym and you have to lift something, put a heavy load on your back or your spine, um, this is going to help with that. So we need the spine to be stable. And here we're going to talk about many of these ligaments. So let's look over here first on the right. We have a bunch of lumbar vertebrae stacked on top of one another. Of course, over here on the right side of this image, this is anterior, and we know that because this is the vertebral body. Over here is posterior because these are the spinous processes. Now, one thing I want to first mention is that if we look between the vertebral bodies, uh, we have the intervertebral disc. We're actually going to dissect that in a little bit. Uh, that's actually the last thing we're going to do. It turns out that the uh, intervertebral disc has several parts, and we're going to look at those later. But for now, let's actually look at the spinous processes. If you look at the tips of these spinous processes, you'll notice there's this string-like ligament that connects them. Okay, this ligament that goes on the tips of the spinous processes, this is what's called the supraspinous ligament. Okay. Supra means on top of and spinous, well, is spinous process. And the reason it's on top of the spinous processes is because if we look at a four-legged creature like a cat, uh, their spinous processes would be projected upward, and so this ligament would sit on top of them, therefore supraspinous. Humans obviously stand upright, so ours is actually posterior or dorsal to the spinous processes. Okay, so this is your supraspinous ligament. Uh, what's important to note about the supraspinous ligament is that it only extends down from the C7 spinous process. It doesn't exist above the C7 spinous process, and to understand that, we need to look at this picture. So here we have the occiput. Uh, this is part of the skull, of course. And right here on the occiput, we have the external occipital protuberance. And if we follow that around to the base of the occiput, we see this sheet-like ligament. And this is what's called the nuchal ligament or the ligamentum nuchi, depending on what source you're looking at. I always call it the nuchal ligament. But it basically is the sheet that seems to be connecting all of these spinous processes and, of course, the posterior tubercle of C1 connects them all the way down to C7. Here's the C7 vertebra right here. Here's its spinous process. And the nuchal ligament extends all the way down there. And so it's important to realize is that the supraspinous ligament uh, goes all the way down to the sacrum, but as it goes up, it terminates at C7. Okay? And above C7, it exists as this sheet-like ligament called the nuchal ligament. So in some ways, you could consider the nuchal ligament a superior extension of the supraspinous ligament. But make sure you understand that the supraspinous ligament, uh, at least proper, only exists at the C7 vertebra and down to the sacrum. Above that, it's the nuchal ligament. Okay? But those collectively are going to join the tips of these spinous processes. If we look between the lengths of the spinous processes, we have the interspinous ligaments. So for example, the inferior part of this uh, spinous process is connected to the superior part of the spinous process below it via this interspinous ligament. And these are segmental ligaments that pretty much exist all the way up the spine and down to the sacrum, okay? Interspinous ligaments. Then we have this ligament right here. This is called a ligamentum flavum. So when you're referring to one of them, it's actually just ligamentum flavum. Collectively, they're referred to as ligamenta flava. That's the plural. And these actually connect the lamina of adjacent vertebrae. So for example, the lamina region of this vertebra above is connected to the lamina region of the vertebra below by a ligamentum flavum. When you stack these vertebrae on top of one another, you actually create a vertebral canal, which is where the spinal cord exists. But what you should notice is actually part of the ligamentum flavum of each segment actually exists in the vertebral canal. So there's two structures right there that we already have. We have the spinal cord and actually part of the ligamentum flavum. And we're going to see in a separate video that actually there's a mechanism 
uh, to actually pull the ligamentum flavum at each level posteriorly, at least in the lumbar spine. And that actually pulls this ligamentum flavum flat and actually increases the diameter of the vertebral column as to prevent compression of the spinal cord, which can be important if you're putting a big load on the spine like you would during a squat or a deadlift. Okay? And so this can actually be pulled posteriorly and increase the diameter of the vertebral column. But we'll talk about that later. All right. If we look at the anterior surface of the vertebral body, we have the anterior longitudinal ligament. Um, here's actually an anterior view, so we can actually see it going around a, a big portion of the periphery of the body. Notice that it goes over the body of the vertebra and also the intervertebral disc. Okay? This is the anterior longitudinal ligament. Now this anterior longitudinal ligament at the base, the very bottom, it goes down to the sacrum, and then all the way up pretty much to the junction of C1 and C2. Okay? Um, there's a reason for that. If we look at the anterior longitudinal ligament that exists between the occiput and C1, that actually gets a different name. It's actually called the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane. And then the portion of it between C1 and C2 is called the anterior atlantoaxial membrane. And then below that, it's just the anterior longitudinal ligament. And the reason that up toward the top near the occiput that we give those different names is because they're slightly different in structure. Even though they're continuous with the anterior longitudinal ligament, they're a little bit more membranous and less ligamentous, I guess you could say, and so they're given different names. But they are continuations of that as they go up and attach to the margin of the foramen magnum. Notice that the anterior longitudinal ligament is quite wide. It's also very strong. Now in contrast, inside the vertebral canal, so on the posterior aspect of the vertebral body, and then also in the canal itself, we have the posterior longitudinal ligament. This one is weaker, than the anterior longitudinal ligament, and also you can see it's obviously more narrow. It's narrower than the anterior uh, part of this. Now the posterior longitudinal ligament, even though it's thinner and weaker than the anterior longitudinal ligament, it follows a similar pattern. So it, down at the sacrum, it moves upward, and then once you get to the level of C1 to C2, it changes its name. Okay, So between the occiput and the C1, C2 region, it's referred to as the tectorial membrane. Okay? And then once it gets down to C1, C2, it, it becomes the posterior longitudinal ligament all the way down to the sacrum. And again, the reason up toward the top near the occiput that it changes names is because it's a little bit less ligamentous in nature and more membranous, so it becomes the tectorial membrane. Okay, So these right here are the major ligaments that stabilize the spine. There are a few other ones that we're going to see exclusively in the neck region that really play a role in stabilizing the atlantoaxial joint. Um, we'll talk about those in a separate video. Uh, but understand this, that these pretty much exist throughout the entire spine and play a major role, therefore. Now, before we conclude this video, let's actually take a look at the intervertebral disc, and we'll see a few regions of this that are very important. So right here we have two vertebral bodies that are stacked on top of one another, and of course the intervertebral disc is going to lie between those. Okay? Now the intervertebral disc is composed of fibrocartilage. Remember that fibrocartilage is the toughest type of cartilage. It's very resistant to compression, it's strong, and so you're going to need it anywhere where you have to have resistance to compression. Well, considering these are lumbar vertebrae, especially there, you have to support the weight of every single vertebra on top of it, including all the tissue, the limbs, the muscles, everything. So this, this has to be pretty tough. It couldn't be elastic or hyaline cartilage. This is going to be a very tough kind of cartilage. Okay? Now, if we look at the regions of this just right in contact with the bodies, okay? not the bulk of it, but just the region in contact with the bodies, uh, those are going to be where we have cartilage end plates. Okay? So the actual fibrocartilage region of the disc does not make contact with the body. There's actually a very thin region right here. You can actually kind of see it. Um, they've kind of distinguished it right here. This is the cartilage end plate. Now the cartilage end plate is composed of hyaline cartilage, but it just plays a role in anchoring the fibrocartilage part indirectly to the body. And you have a cartilage end plate both on the superior part of the disc and the inferior part. 
And again, like I said, they actually play a role in anchoring the disc itself indirectly to the body. One thing I want to mention about the cartilage end plate is actually when you have a disc rupture in the spine, the first structure to go, the weakest link in the chain, is the cartilage end plate. It's actually not the fibrocartilage part itself. Cartilage end plate's the first part to give during a disc rupture. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're actually going to take this top vertebra off and take a superior view of the disc. And what we're actually going to see is there's two regions. We have an outer annulus fibrosis region and then an inner nucleus pulposus region. Now in this picture right here, they appear to be two separate structures. But actually what you would see is if you did a dissection of this in real life, there's not really a clear cut uh, distinguishing difference between these two regions. Um, it's actually more of a graded uh, progression from annulus fibrosis to nucleus pulposus. But for the most part, if you're talking about this nucleus pulposus or nucleus pulposus-like is going to be internal, and then annulus fibrosis or annulus fibrosis-like will be external to that. Okay? And when we're talking about the annulus fibrosis, the densest regions of nerve endings are going to be in the outer part of the annulus fibrosis, although all of these are actually supplied with pain receptors or nociceptors. Okay? Um, also, it's important to realize that the disc itself is avascular. It doesn't matter if we're talking about the annulus fibrosis, nucleus pulposus, or the cartilage end plates. They are avascular. And so to get nutrients like oxygen and glucose and things like that, they're going to solely rely on diffusion from neighboring blood vessels. But there are no blood vessels in the disc itself. Okay. The other thing I wanted to mention before we conclude this, just a little piece here, not really uh, so much important for this video, is that remember when you have two vertebra stacked on top of one another, uh, you get the formation of this hole called the intervertebral foramen. And remember that the spinal cord is going to go down the column, which you can't see here, but the spinal nerves exit left and right through the associated intervertebral foramen. Okay? All right, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.